Good morning, Covenant. It's good to be back with you all again this morning. We have one announcement before we go into our worship service this morning, and that is the Good Friday service that we get to look forward to this coming Friday at 7 o'clock. Uh, so if you could please plan to come to the Good Friday service this coming Friday at 7 o'clock for fellowship, worship, and to hear God's word proclaimed. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 68. Psalm 68, we're going to be preaching from Ephesians 4 this morning, and Ephesians 4 includes a quote from Psalm 68, and so I wanted to open our service this morning with reading the last four verses of this psalm. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Let's rise to hear the Lord's greeting. Beloved congregation, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's begin by singing this morning together. Turning in our Psalter hymnals to Psalter number 310. Psalter number 310. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't think of a better way to begin our worship to our God, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, than singing hallelujah. going to read God's law this morning together from Exodus 20. And let me just say, this is something that I love to be able to do with you all. I'm in the OPC currently, and we don't have a regular practice of reading God's law each and every week. We do go through it from time to time, but I love that we can come together and go and see what the Lord requires of his people. And as we read this, we need, to, we need to draw to mind time and time again that if you know who Jesus Christ is, if you have placed your faith in him, if you have lived your life and, and you seek to serve him in all that you do, that this law is a wonderful thing for you. It's your delight. And so if you know who Jesus Christ is, if you've placed your faith in him, don't hear these words as your condemnation. Don't hear these words as things that you need to do to be confident that you are saved. Hear these words as life. Hear these words as what we get to do because we are in the Lord. So search yourselves this morning as we read from Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servants or your female servants or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And as we see what the purpose of this law is, we turn to the New Testament to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as he summarizes this law in Mark 12. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. That's the Lord Jesus Christ's summary of what the law is intended to drive us towards. And so if you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, this law shows us how we love the Lord our God and how we love our neighbor. And so it's a wonderful thing to be able to go into his word and and search it out and see where we have failed, not because we're worthy of falling or fearful of falling short, but because we know Jesus Christ has fulfilled that law and by the power of his spirit enables us to love the Lord and to love each other well. The law is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and we're going to sing of that now as we turn in our Psalter hymnals to Psalter number 29. Psalter number 29. We're going to sing stanzas 1, 2, Four and five. One, two, four, and five. You see the title there Jehovah's Perfect Law.
Amen. We'll read from Ephesians 2 for our text is sharing pardon this morning. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 11. Paul begins by reminding us who we were. He writes in verse 11, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility." And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's a remarkable truth that this text records, a remarkable comfort that though we once were far off, Gentiles bound by our own sin and flesh and weakness, yet the Lord Jesus Christ preaches this gospel of peace to us while we were afar off and welcomes us into his household of believers if we would place our faith in him. Beloved, what a wonderful truth this is this morning that we get to share together. Now as we go forward in our worship, we will go towards our congregational prayer this morning. And in our congregational prayer this morning, I want to be able to pray for this church. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Ephesians 4 is the passage we'll be considering this morning, and it's all about the church. And so we want to give thanksgiving to God, first and foremost, thanksgiving for this body of believers that we have here at Covenant URC. Thanksgiving for the unity that we have, for the diversity that is here, and for that eternal end that we have in Christ. But we also want to pray Help for the church. Pray, lift up our needs before the Lord. And so we'll do that together this morning as we bow in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we gather together before you this morning as your church. We gather together as those who have been called out, called out of this world called out of the kingdom of darkness and called into your marvelous light. Lord, we come together as your church. That though we once were Gentiles who were far off, Lord, breaking every letter and rule of your law and living in enmity against you. Yet, Lord, at the right time you died for the ungodly and now you have preached and continue to preach this gospel of peace and reconciliation that can be found in you. And so we gather together here first and foremost as redeemed sinners. Lord, those who you have called out from our sin and misery and called into your marvelous light. Lord, what a wonderful thing that we can rejoice in that. And Lord, that we see the benefits of that as well. That we gather together as a unified church. That there is no longer any distinction between different classes, between different races, between different biological sexes, Lord, but that we are all one in you. Lord, what a wonderful truth this is that we participate as one body. 
of which you are the head. And yet, Lord, even as we rejoice in this oneness, even as we rejoice in this unity that we have in you, we we notice this diversity as well, that you've given each of us different gifts, that you've given us all different experiences and backgrounds. And yet, Lord, you and your sovereignty are able to use these things to press towards that unity. And so we thank you for the diversity that we see here as well. That through this unity and diversity, this, this, this mixture of these two seemingly opposite things, that you are driving your church towards its eternal end, that you have secured for it in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, that because Jesus Christ died, was buried, and then rose triumphant from the grave and, and ascended into heaven, that we have this hope too, that we as well, because we know you, because you have called us out, because you have enabled us by your spirit to place our faith in you, that we too have that eternal end set before us. And so, Lord, give us eyes this morning that when we get caught up on the mundane, as we get caught up on the day-to-day trials and, and urgencies of this life, that we would never take our eyes off of the clouds, but that we would always have one eye looking towards heaven, Lord, in light of this eternal glory that is ours, and that you would bring comfort, that you would bring joy, and that even now we'd be able to rejoice in that future hope that you have secured for us, Lord. It is, it is so secure, it is so certain, it is so wonderful, and we thank you that you have invited us in to participate in that. But while that is true, Lord, there are still these needs that we have here, these needs that you have promised to hear, these needs that you have promised to fulfill, Lord, because you love your people and because Jesus Christ intercedes on our behalf even now. And so we lift up, in a particular way this morning, Jeff Labazu's dad. Lord, we've heard that he had a brain, cancer, a brain tumor removed that is being biopsied. And we pray that that biopsy would come back and show that it was not a cancerous tumor. Lord, we pray that it would just be a, a mass that was able to be removed and that he would be able to proceed on with his life without ill effects stemming forth from that. Lord, we, we pray that you would mercifully heal his body and, and heal that, that site where they removed this tumor from and that he would be able to continue on living uh, his life in a, a healthy, abundant way. So Lord, we lift Jeff Labazu's dad up before you this morning. We also pray and we rejoice with, with Will and Nona Postma as we see that their 48th wedding anniversary is today. Lord, what a wonderful example these two can be of what love and Uh, nurturing ought to look like in the marriage relationship. When a husband cares for his wife and a wife cares for her husband, Lord, we have this this picture that we see in Ephesians 5 that, that this is the way that the church ought to be. This is the way the church ought to be in our relationship with Christ, that just as Christ gave himself for the church, so husbands give themselves for their wives. And and just as wives Just as the church submits to Christ, so wives submit to their husbands. And and in this amazing arrangement, you have have shown and demonstrated that this this is the way that your church ought to be. But this is also the way that marriage ought to be. And so we thank you for the testimony of Will and Nona, that you have worked through them and that you have given them your grace and mercy, Lord, to get through the hurdles and trials of life and to bring them out together, bonded and more and more in love with you, we pray. We also pray as we approach this uh, season of vacation with spring break coming up, that anyone who is traveling for spring break, anyone who may be traveling even right now, that you would give them traveling mercies and that you would bring them to their destination and bring them home at the appointed time. Lord, be faithful in that. We also pray for this church body, these, these men and women and children that are here, that you would set them apart in such a way that that they would not just take for granted this amazing benefit that they have in you, but Lord, that they would live their lives for you now. 
that the recipients of grace would display that grace in their life and that, that the people that they come into interaction with on a day-to-day basis would see something different. That they would grow curious and that they would ask thoughtful questions. And Lord, that you would give these people here the ability to speak into that. To speak into it because they know the, the darkness of their former state and, and truly desire that others would participate in this amazing, abundant life that we have here in this church. And we continue to pray also that you would bring a pastor that you would bring an under-shepherd who could lead this flock, Lord, someone who could work with the elders who have been installed here and that could watch over and care in a particular, wonderful way for this flock. Lord, I've seen here the love and the compassion and the mercy and the attitude of this flock, Lord, how they seek to live for you, how they serve you week after week, and Lord, what a joy it would be for them to have their own under-shepherd someone to walk alongside of them, someone to rejoice when they rejoice and someone to weep when they weep. Lord, care for this flock here by providing them an under-shepherd in your due time. We pray these things in your name. And now as we go forward in our service, I pray that you would bless the preached word, that you would make it a benefit to all of us and that we would come away from this service with such a full, wonderful idea of what your church is and what your church ought to be. Lord, may it be so. We pray these things in your name. Amen. This time we will give our tithes and offerings. The offering this morning is for the general fund.
Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father, Lord, as we have just collected our tithes and offerings this morning as a part of our worship to you, we pray that you would use these things for your glory, for your kingdom, that your gospel message would go forth from this place with strength and power and that you would use it to draw more and more people into your kingdom. Lord, put your blessing upon these funds that have been gathered and let them be used for your work. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As we prepare to go into God's word this morning together in Ephesians 4, let's first sing another song. Psalter number 230. Psalter number 230. What shall I render to the Lord? We'll sing all five verses. be seated. Open with me, if you would, to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. We'll read this morning, verses 7 through 16. That'll also be our text of Ephesians 4. This is the word of God. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says... 
When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended, far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who was the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit would bless it this morning to us. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we have just read this text of your word from Ephesians 4, and Lord, we, we come before you confessing our dependency upon you to understand it, to hear it, and to apply it. And so, Lord, work powerfully by your spirit through this weak instrument. Lord, give me what I need to to preach this, that Jesus Christ would go forth and that we would be encouraged to come together as a church for your name's glory and honor. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So we open our sermon this morning. I want you all to begin by Picturing in your mind the image of your ideal church. Your ideal church. What comes to mind for you? Maybe you begin by picturing this church building in your mind. It's it's got a large sanctuary. It's got a a fantastic fellowship hall for people to gather into after the service and, and have conversation. Maybe it has lots of classrooms and nursery access with with audio and visual piped straight into it. Wouldn't that be amazing? Maybe you envision this robust Sunday school and catechism program where you can send the children of the church to learn more about the Bible from faithful teachers. And of course, your vision of the ideal church probably has a pastor A pastor who can preach the word with with truth and authority, who maintains your interest all the way through the sermon. Maybe he even wears a suit to the pulpit in your mind. It might include a a picture of fantastic fellowship, a, a culture of welcoming people into your homes for meals and staying long after the service for good conversation. It it might be a church where it's full of people who never fight, who who never gossip and pray daily for one another. Maybe a church that does an excellent job welcoming outsiders or a church that visits regularly with widows, widowers, and shut-ins. Maybe, maybe if, you're, maybe if you're being honest with yourself, it's a church that has all of those things going on, but, but it's also a place that doesn't ask too much of you to accomplish those goals. A place where you can show up, you can enjoy the proceedings, you can be edified and encouraged, and then you can go on your way with your life. And so I ask you again, what's, what's this picture of the ideal church that you have in your mind? Well, in this passage of Ephesians, Paul is setting up an ideal of, Paul is setting up an image of the ideal church, and, and while we may have our own ideas of what that looks like, and some of those may be great and and, and wonderful things, Paul identifies the fundamental quality of the ideal, well-functioning church. And here it is. The ideal church is a place where every member can use their diverse gifts for the building up of the body into Christ. I'll say that again, the ideal church is the place where every member is using their diverse gifts for the building up of the body into Christ. We're going to unpack this throughout this passage under three points this morning. First, we're going to see the giving of gifts to the church. Second, the implementation of those gifts. And finally, the purpose of those gifts. 
But first, to set some context, you'll see in the first, verse, first six verses of Ephesians 4, Paul speaks of the ideal church there, but he speaks of the ideal church as a unified church. Many of you here will recognize that familiar string of ones that's laced through that passage. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. But beginning in verse 7, the first verse of our text, Paul shifts gears where he had spent the first six verses talking about the essential unity of the ideal church, he goes on in these verses to talk about the essential diversity. Let's look again at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Maybe that seems like a curious verse to you. Maybe you wonder what's going on here What does Paul exactly mean? What what does he mean by grace? Each one of who, according to what measure, what gifts? Paul, what are you talking about here in verse 7? Well, it's almost as if Paul anticipated that these questions would arise because verses 8 through 10 of our text, they're inserted almost as a parenthesis so that Paul can explain the meaning of what he's getting at in verse 7. And so, Look at me again with, look, look, at, look at verse 8 with me again. Verse 8, this is that quote from Psalm 68 that I referenced earlier in the service. It reads, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That verse is imagery. It's imagery. It's this picture that Paul is setting forth to illustrate what he's talking about in verse 7. And the image that Paul is getting at here, it's this picture of this old tradition where a conquering king from from kingdoms past, he would have ridden off into battle and he would have conquered an enemy force. And then this is the triumphant return of that king where that king marches back to the capital city of his own kingdom and he's parading through the streets of his capital city and you have men and women and boys and girls cheering him on from the streets, praising him as he, as he marches victoriously through the center of the city and behind that conquering king would have been the host of captives, those who he had taken prisoner, those who he had established his authority over, and they would follow in a train behind him as he marched victorious through the city. And as he marched through, he would would spread the spoils of the war to his loyal subjects, giving gifts to all of the people, the men and the women and the boys and girls who were cheering him on. It's, It's this victorious imagery that we're seeing set forth in verse 8 here. a celebration. Then in verses 9 through 10, Paul goes on to unpack exactly what this powerful, conquering, victorious imagery is pointing to. What is this imagery pointing to? And, And we see that it speaks to Christ's victory over sin and death and hell. You see, Christ is the conquering king. Sin, death, and hell are the captives following behind. He's subjugated their power and he's now ascended into heaven. What Paul's really doing in verses 9 through 10, he's giving the gospel the abridged edition, the shortened form of the gospel. We see sin and hell and death are reigning. They they held us captive. We were stuck in our sin. The fear of death reigned in all of our minds and hell loomed before us. But then Christ the King descended from heaven to earth. He conquered the powers of evil, taking them captive, and then he ascended into heaven, pouring out his Spirit and filling all things. Those are verses 9 through 10. And so you see that that this imagery, this gospel background, this is necessary information that we need in this little parenthesis so that we could understand verse 7. But now, since all of these things have taken place, since Christ has conquered the powers of evil and has ascended into heaven, since Christ is the reigning, ascended king, verse 7, grace was given to each one of us 
according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 7 is possible because verses 8 through 10 happened. Do you see that? But then we'll see some observations here. It's the first observation as we look at verse 7 a little bit closer. And the first thing we see is that Christ has given his people gifts. This is what Paul means by grace here. He's, he's not talking about saving grace, but rather gifts of grace. And if you want to look for a parallel passage to where he uses this language, you can read Romans 12 this afternoon. In Romans 12, Paul lists several different gifts of grace. There's the gift of prophecy, the gift of service, the gift of teaching, the gift of exhortation, the gift of contributing, the gift of leading, the gift of doing acts of mercy. These are different gifts of grace. It's by no means a comprehensive list, but it gives us a pretty good idea for some of the gifts that Christ has given in his victorious ascension parade. That's celebration. But then our second observation that we see in verse 7 is that Christ has given gifts to each of us. He's given them to me. He's given them to you. If you have confessed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have been the generous recipient of Christ's amazing mercy and grace. There, there is not one single person who stands in the streets celebrating Christ's victorious return who is not the recipient of a gift of grace. Kids, have you ever been to a parade before? Have you ever been to a parade that, that had floats where they, where they tossed candy out to you on the street? That's fun, right? They're giving you little gifts and you get to go and collect them and, and build up your little baggie. But, but have you ever been at a parade where you were standing next to a bigger person? Someone who's a little bit taller, someone who's a little bit stronger, someone who is a little bit faster. Well, what happens? They're the first ones to get the candy, aren't they? They get the best candy. They get the most candy. And sometimes you might feel completely left out. You might even return home without any candy at all. But that's not the way it works in Christ's victory parade. You see, in Christ's victory parade, each one of us receives gifts. The elderly man or woman, the little boy or little girl, the middle-aged mom and dad, the single person, the disabled child. You see, Christ gives to the strong and he gives to the weak. He takes notice of each and every one of his people and bestows upon them these generous, lavish gifts of the Spirit. Thirdly, we'll see that Christ gives his gift to each of us, but he gives them in different measure. Now, this is the first time we're seeing that diversity talked about in the text. So far, he's been talking about unity, 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 but now he's introducing this idea that essential unity is accomplished through an essential diversity. We don't all have the same gifts. Isn't that true? We can look around and we see people with gifts that we don't have. Or, or maybe if you see someone that has a similar gift, we can see that we don't all have gifts in the same measure. We're not all as good at certain things as other people are. Have you ever known someone with the gift of hospitality? That's an amazing gift. Someone who can invite you into their home and just set a mood that makes everyone feel welcome and comfortable. Maybe they're playing orchestral music in the background. They've got candles burning in the living room. The lamp lighting is perfectly cozy and the, the fireplace is burning. They've got appetizers, they've got the main course, and they've got desserts. If they really go above and beyond, they might even have a candle burning in the bathroom. It's just an amazing gift that it makes you never really want to leave their home. Alicia and I found out early on in our experience at Puritan, we had some foreign students over, and this was right after we had gotten married. And we discovered that the gift of hospitality was going to take some work for us. We had these students over, and we forgot to set up the tablecloth and, and put the spread out. 
We were serving hot, soupy chili, and these foreign students who had never had American chili somehow, they were grabbing these thin, flimsy paper plates and scooping this hot, soupy chili on the paper plate, and you can just imagine the mess that that made as the chili was seeping through the bottom of the plates. But we all have different gifts, and we all have them in different measure. The final thing we'll notice in verse 7 here is that these spiritual gifts are not natural to us. They are given by the Spirit. They, they, are, they are the result of being filled with this powerful Spirit of the ascended Lord. Do you, do you hear that? These gifts are the results of being filled with the powerful spirit of the ascended Lord. They're, they're the gracious gift of the power of Christ himself. Isn't that amazing? You see, many of us have natural gifts, and, and Christ may choose to work through these. He may enhance our natural gifting for the sake of the building up of his kingdom. But he may also work powerfully to transform, to transform someone. To give them a gift that is not native to them, but that he also uses powerfully. Maybe, maybe you've known someone, uh, a shy and timid boy that you grew up with who didn't really like to talk to many people and kind of stuck to himself. Yet the Lord placed this powerful call upon him to pursue ministry. And gave him a gift of the spirit to preach and teach. And he was used powerfully for the building up of the kingdom. Kids, God can do that. He can give you these spiritual gifts that are not natural to you and use them wonderfully for the sake of his kingdom. And what that demonstrates, this, this wonderful truth that the spirit of Christ brings the power of Christ together into the people of Christ. It's an amazing reality. And no matter what measure, no matter what gift, no matter what person, he can use it powerfully for the building up of his kingdom. Isn't that an encouraging word that we have in verse 7 of Ephesians 4? And so we need to pause for a moment. We need to think, if you are in Christ, if you have come to him in faith and repentance, if you have confessed him as your Lord and Savior, if he has freed you from the tyranny of death and hell and you are praising him, cheering him on in that victorious ascension parade, what gifts has he given to you? How has he equipped you? How is his spirit working in you to enhance a natural talent or maybe to overcome a native deficiency is to proclaim Christ's kingdom? It's a question that we all need to wrestle with because, because as we see going forward in this text, the Apostle Paul, the, the Holy Spirit, calls us to put our gifts that we have received into action. And that will move us into our second point this morning, the implementation of these gifts. The implementation of these gifts. What good does having a gift do if you're not going to put it into action? That's a question. Wolfgang Mozart. Wolfgang Mozart, amazing child prodigy. He's one of the greatest piano players and composers in the history of the world. And you know that's true because you recognize his name when I said it to you. Wolfgang Mozart. This child prodigy, he, he started playing the piano at age three. He began composing music, writing out full scripts of music at age four and five. What were you doing at age five? I couldn't ride my bike yet, but Wolfgang Mozart was writing full symphonies. He had this incredible genius. He had this rare and special gift which empowered him to write this music that has endured throughout all the ages. And it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that if Wolfgang Mozart, who was given these gifts, decided not to use them, that would have been a, a crime against humanity. He would have robbed us of this amazing talent, and we never would have been able to experience the joys and the benefits of his music. Well, similarly, after Paul establishes this objective truth that, that all those who have come to Christ have these spiritual gifts, he calls us to put these gifts into action. 
Look with me again at verses 11 and 12 of the text. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. You see, Paul begins by identifying pastors, ministers, shepherds, teachers. Now, there's some debate in this text, there is, about what these varied responsibilities look like, what their essential roles are, and whether or not they still have effect in the church today. And and we could take time to develop that idea at a further time, maybe in a systematic theology class. But for the sake of Paul's argument here, what's important to recognize is that Christ himself has ordained certain men to certain positions, giving them particular gifts to lead his church. He's given them spiritual gifts to teach and preach the gospel, and these gifts are implemented, as Paul says, for the purpose of equipping the saints. It's a weighty calling. Young men, boys, middle-aged men, is this a calling that you have wrestled with? Have you ever wrestled with whether or not the Lord had given you gifts to lead his church, to preach and teach? Has he worked in you a character of godly humility and compassion and self-control? Has he gifted you with the desire to search his word and bring it to his people week in and week out? There's a reality that Jesus Christ does not call every man to be a pastor. But it's also true that he has gifted certain men, and so each man must search himself. Have you searched yourself? Have you wondered if the Lord may be calling you to ministry? Now, you may ultimately conclude that God has not called you to be a pastor for one reason or another. Maybe it's a relief to you. And that's okay, but that doesn't mean that there's no use for you in the church. That doesn't mean that there's no gifting that God has given you. We've just seen that God has given each of us a gift. And while the job of the pastors is to equip the saints, the job of the saints is to go forth from that equipping to do the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Now, there are some translations that that make it sound a little bit different. There are are some translations that make it sound like the job of the pastor is to equip the saints, do the work of ministry, and build up the body of Christ. And it kind of gives us the idea that the saints just need to come in and hear the word and be edified and scoot out, and that's it. But the original Greek actually portrays this idea that the ESV captures well here when Paul is really saying that everyone in the church... Every single one of us is called to do the work of the church. That may seem like a radical idea. One pastor referred to the Americanization of the American congregation, where each congregation has essentially turned into a market for religious consumers. And that, that hits pretty close to home, doesn't it? A lot of times that might be how we think about church. You see, we've got the CEO of the business who walks through those doors every Sunday and marches up to this pulpit and preaches and teaches the word. He does the work of the church, and then the responsibility of the congregation is to file in and hear that, be, be inspired, and then, and then head home until next week. You see, in this type of system, this American type of business system, the church has become this kind of thing that we just, we just watch. We just kind of sit in our pew and watch what's going on for our own personal growth. And and so then whether you watch in person or whether you watch online or whether you go from different church week by week, it doesn't really matter because church is all about showing up, hearing the word, and heading home. But this isn't the vision of the church that Christ has established. Christ didn't establish a business institution that would mesh well with American capitalist expectations. He hasn't given gifts to each one of his people so that they could be a watching church. He's called us to be a doing church. Brothers and sisters, if if you think that it would have been an absolute shame if Mozart didn't use his natural gifts to write music that was beautiful and harmonious, then, 
how much greater of a catastrophe would it be if we are not using our spiritual gifts that are evidence of the power of Christ himself in us for the building up of his kingdom? Beloved, the spiritual gift that you have received, to whatever degree Christ has measured it to you, whatever gift it might be, it has, has greater potential. It has greater effect. It has greater glory than the greatest natural gift you can imagine because its work is greater. It's kingdom work. It's salvific, eternal work. There is no greater gift. There is no greater power. There is no higher calling. And it wouldn't be a stretch to say that it would be a crime against humanity if you kept your spiritual gift for yourself and did not bring it for the building up of Christ's church. So what does this mean for us practically? Well, first and foremost, the easy step is that you need to be at church. You need to show up. Sunday after Sunday, you can't do the work of ministry. You can't build up the body of Christ if you're sitting at home on your couch watching the live stream with a bucket of popcorn on your lap. Hebrews 10 is very clear on this. It drills this point home that Christians should not neglect meeting together, but they ought to encourage each other, stirring one another up to good works. But second is that you need to get involved at church. It's not enough to show up, sit in your pew, and scoot. I know that that's a temptation. It certainly has been for me in my life. But if you are in Christ, then he has bestowed upon you spiritual gifts that are to be used for the work of ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. On one Sunday, this might mean reaching outside of yourself to see a visitor, someone you don't recognize, someone you've never seen before, and and go and talk with them. Welcome them. Affirm that you are glad that they are here and and ask them questions about themselves. On another Sunday, it might mean praying with a praying with a brother or sister about a particular sin struggle that they've been wrestling with throughout the week or or about a trial that they've been enduring. It might mean grabbing them and pulling them to the side of the fellowship hall and saying, brother, sister, can I pray with you about this trial? Maybe it means showing up early and gathering together with some brothers and sisters before the service so that you can pray together for the ministry of the word to go forth, that the Lord would use it powerfully for the building up of his kingdom. It it might mean preparing enough food ahead of time so that you can welcome someone from your church over for lunch afterwards. You see, the work of ministry, the building up of the body of Christ, it takes place in all of these different ways in a very great diverse ways because we have very great diverse abilities, diverse gifts. But in all of this diversity, each one of us is called not to be a passive recipient of the church, but an active participant in the church. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a serious question that that all of us need to wrestle with. Are you a consumer of the church or an active participant in it? Have you considered how the Lord has equipped you to do the ministry of the word and to build up the body of Christ? Maybe you've fallen into the trap of American consumerism. Maybe you've gotten into the habit of watching church rather than being the church. Maybe you're simply struggling to find the motivation to take an active role from Sunday to Sunday or you consider yourself too busy with other things. The reality is these are common pitfalls that even Jesus-loving, genuine, believing Christians can fall into. It's something that we are all prone to, even in our new natures. And that's why Paul is writing. See, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, not simply leaving them with a command to be better or else. He leaves them with this, with this in the last part of our pericope here, he leaves us with this amazing purpose to motivate us to encourage us, to reach outside of ourselves, to be the church. And so we'll observe that purpose this morning as we move to our final point, the purpose of the gifts. And the question 
at hand is why. Why? We've seen that Christ in his victorious parade has given gifts. We've seen that he has called us to implement those gifts. The question that remains is why? We see that in verses 13 through 14. In verse 13, we see the positive effects. When every member applies themselves and their spiritual gifts for the good of the church, we see that the church will grow in unity of faith and knowledge. The church will grow in maturity. It will grow in Christ-likeness. And then in verse 14, we see the contrast to that. What will happen if we don't? The church will be tossed to and fro by false doctrines, human cunning, and deceitful schemes. The stakes are the stakes are high. The stakes are unbelievably high. When, when there's a breakdown in one individual member of the body, it can lead to a breakdown of the entire body. See, there's a reason why Paul uses this metaphor of the human body to illustrate the diverse function of the church. You can have every system working perfectly. You can have a great heart rate, low cholesterol, a 225-pound bench press. See, the great diversity in the human body, it, 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 it encourages this amazing unity of the person. But if just one thing goes wrong, say your, say your pancreas isn't creating enough insulin, it can throw the entire body into wreck, into havoc. Just ask someone who has diabetes what that's like when one part of their body isn't doing the job. That's how it is in the church. What, what will happen if one part of the body of Christ breaks down and stops using their gifts to serve Christ's kingdom? What would happen if pastors stopped using their gifts to preach and teach and equip the saints with the bread of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What would happen if teachers stopped teaching about the truths of Scripture? What would happen if servers stopped serving or their hospitable stopped being hospitable? What would happen if the generous stopped contributing or those who do acts of mercy stopped doing acts of mercy? What would happen if the leaders stopped leading? Well, if all these things happened at once, you, you wouldn't have a church anymore. But what would happen if even one of these things disappeared? What if just one person decided that they didn't need to use their spiritual gifts for the well-being of the church? Then you still might have a church. Yeah, you, you, must, you still might have that body that comes together, but it's going to be a church that's seriously dilapidated. You see, you might have a strong that has, or a church that has a strong pastor who is sound on doctrine and teaching, but maybe it's a church that's weak in hospitality and service. And so, so the people come week to week to hear the sound teaching and the sound doctrine, but they never actually experience the warmth and love that ought to resemble a church. They might leave a church that, that is filled with sound doctrine and good teaching because it's filled with nothing but infighting and disunity because it's not a place where love is displayed. But then if they go to a place where love is displayed and hospitality and service and acts of mercy are performed, but truth is not soundly taught, then when they go there, they might find a church that loves, but it'll be a twisted type of love. They'll, they'll find a love that accepts you no matter what sin you're engaging in. They'll find a love that affirms your errant doctrines. They'll find a love that affirms a sinful lifestyle. They'll find a church that seems united and loving and welcoming. But it won't be a union that is founded on the plain truth of Scripture. It won't be founded on faith and knowledge of the Son of God. It, it will not be a unity that brings people together to the full stature of the fullness of Christ. No, it'll be a love that is preached from the lips of false teachers, deceitful and cunning men, and it will blow people to and fro on the waves of falsehood, unmoored from this anchor of truth, and cast them into the rocks of destruction. It's a love that will be there that really, truly isn't love at all. It's demented, it's dilapidated, it's deceitful. 
But then imagine this. Imagine this. Imagine an Ephesians 4 church. What would happen if every person in the church was using their spiritual gifts for the building up of the body? What would happen if faithful shepherds and teachers proclaimed the truth of God's word, refusing to compromise with culture on truth? What would happen if people, having heard the good news of the gospel and and responding in faith, began to serve the church, greeting visitors and striking up conversations about the gospel, volunteering for nurseries, Sunday school, sound system, prayer meetings, cooking meals for families? What would What would happen if people, having been welcomed into the family of God, welcomed other people into their homes for a meal? What would happen if we all contributed generously in our tithing for the sake of gospel ministry? What would happen if if the leaders of the church devoted themselves to godly leadership, seeking zealously to watch over the well-being of the flock? What would happen if the evangelists went out to all of the highways and byways and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ and welcomed other people into that type of church? Oh, beloved, there you would have a church. That is verse 15 in our text says, speaks the truth and does so in love. That will be a church that grows in unity and maturity and Christ-likeness. That will be a church which sees new converts walking through the doors, being loved and strengthened and nourished in the faith. That will be a church whose members stand fast in the face of cultural movements, which resist the cunning of false teachers, and which grows up every way into him who is the head, that is, Jesus Christ. That's your ideal church. The Ephesians 4 church. Brothers and sisters, the stakes are high. Would you deprive the church of the spiritual gifts that God has given you? Or would you apply yourself, no matter your role, no matter the measure of your gift, to see Christ's kingdom expand for the glory of his name? As we draw to a close this morning, must issue one final word. You see, it'd be easy to read a text like this and be extremely burdened by it. Maybe you're wrestling with these truths and you've been convicted that though you love Jesus Christ, though you've placed your faith in him, you've been squandering these gifts that he's given to you. Maybe you feel a burden to do these different types of things as a way of proving your faith, as a way of boosting your confidence, as a way of proving that you have salvation for yourself, that your faith is genuine. We might all be digesting these things in different ways. I've certainly been convicted as I've wrestled with this text myself. But as we apply these truths to our lives, we we must not be motivated by guilt or shame or a desire to prove ourselves. What we're motivated by to pursue this ideal church vision is love. You see, Paul doesn't start the book of Philipp- uh, excuse me, Ephesians by scolding the church to get their act together and to get to work. Remember, this is chapter 4. And in chapter 1, he begins by extolling the work of Jesus Christ for calling his people out of darkness and redeeming us. In chapter 2, he goes on to praise God for the richness of his grace and mercy towards us that though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, yet so great was his mercy towards us that he made us alive in himself. We need to get this straight. Before Paul tells the people how they ought to live, He reminds them how they've been made alive. Before he tells the people what they ought to do, he reminds them what Christ has already done. See, beloved, using your spiritual gifts for the sake of Christ, it isn't this burden that you need to perform in order to be saved. It's this amazing blessing that you get to partake in because you already have been. We do not work to earn Christ's love, but because we have received it. Maybe you know someone that was converted later in life. I know, I know many people. 
maybe converted in their teens, 20s, 30s. How often isn't it true that those people are the most giving, most selfless, most servant-minded, on-fire, passionate, church-loving people? How many people, how many men do you know converted in their 20s that, that dropped everything immediately after to pursue pastoral ministry? Why do you think that is? I'd say it's because they're intimately aware of the desperation of their former state. See, they know what it is like to live utterly without hope, without freedom, without joy, without peace. They know the overwhelming feeling of stumbling along in their own filth and and misery, completely dead and lifeless in their souls, fighting as mercenary soldiers against God, as slaves to sin and Satan. It's, It's these people that know in an intimate way what it is like to be marching down the road to eternal damnation, coming closer and closer to that fiery pit, the heat storming off of that pit and and affecting them in every single way, getting hotter and hotter the closer they run. And then to hear the words of Christ saying to them, I love you. I died for you. Come to me, dear sinner, and I will give you rest. And they want nothing more than to show others that love. Do you know the depths of Christ's love for you, dear congregation? Do you remember who you were when Christ called you out of darkness? then live out of that love. And dear friend, if you have never known the love of Christ, then hear it held out to you today. Believe that Christ has come to free you from bondage to sin, to wash you clean in his blood, to present you spotless before the throne of grace. Place your faith in his finished work. Repent of your sin and rebellion against him Join up with those parading people celebrating the return of victorious King Jesus, watching those who subdued you, following behind him in bondage, and then live for him out of the love with which he has loved you so that you too might grow up in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, what a wonderful passage of scripture this is. Lord, we thank you for your spirit and breathing it out and showing us what the church ought to be. That while we are called to be unified, yet, Lord, you have called us to a diversity to search out our gifts and to apply them, to to apply them and implement them for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, what higher aim is there? What greater good, what higher calling could we possibly pursue than to build up your kingdom by doing the work of ministry? We do this not out of bondage or fear of condemnation. We do this not out of fear, but because Jesus Christ has called us from darkness to light. Because we know what it is to be in rebellion against you. We know the misery of that state. We know what it is to be terrified of death and hell. We know what it is to sit under the authority and power of Jesus as our judge. And we know what it is to be transformed, to hear those sweet gospel words invade our souls and call us out of darkness, to pull us out of that train of captivity, that march to hell, and to bring us into the parade of our victorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, let that reality sit 
with us this week. And let that drive us, that same love with which you loved us, drive us to love others so much that we would stop at nothing to call out to sinners walking to hell and invite them in, calling them out of the world and into your church. Lord, may it be so, and may it all be for your glory. Amen. As our service draws to a close this morning, we'll respond singing Psalter number 496, By the Sea of Crystal. And as you sing, this is a picture of the church victorious. Gather together in that eternal place, all of those who have been called out, worshiping together by the sea of crystal. This is our eternal aim. This is our eternal end. Think on that as we sing together, Psalter number 469. Doxology will sing together from number 488. Now blessed be Jehovah God.
hear the parting blessing from our God, from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.